Hey, uh, Xbox is doing a lot of really cool stuff right now, and uh, I think I think they're getting people excited for the future of gaming, and we should probably talk about some of that. What is going on, guys? d back again with yet another video talking about Phil Spencer's latest interview where he does talk about multiple different aspects of Xbox, xCloud, new games, Microsoft, how to make the best taco in the universe, and uh, much more. Actually, this is brought to you thanks to IGN, who just so happened to drop this at the same time we were having our podcast. What a weird coincidence. So while Phil is uh, rarely seen on anything but a corporate-owned podcast, he does still do shows, and sometimes he'll drop some tidbits. He'll give his perspective on some things, and we can always learn a thing or five from Phil Spencer. So, of course, if you end up liking this video, if you end up liking this video, hit the like button and show a buddy or two. It really helps more than you know. Subscribe, all that good stuff, as we get into the topic. Now, we're going to get into some unannounced Xbox projects, but I wanted to start with something that uh, the guys at IGN are surprised by because, I mean, we've been talking about this for a couple years. This is the eventual goal is to enable all of these devices to bring any game to you from any console. That does include the eventual ability to start games instantly through streaming without waiting for your downloads. All of these different demo trials that will be instantly available, as well as, of course, streaming next generation games on older xboxes not news to us but um you know interesting reaction here and phil does give a bit more detail here i figured i would start with this and then we'll ramp things up in e3 week that said hey uh starting with flight simulator we're gonna just deliver that flight simulator to your xbox one through the cloud so, right. so that you can still play that game so i mean that's an incredible solution i mean is that the solution to allow the, the teams to maximize the new hardware while still not leaving your uh, your Xbox One customers behind? Well, that's the plan. Now, I don't want to confuse anybody. And I know other people have said different things. You know, when it comes to playing from the cloud, it's not replicating playing from local hardware. Right. Like the, the best way to go play an Xbox Series X game is on an Xbox Series X physically plugged into your television and, and playing that game. But as you said, whether it's chip shortages or frankly, just where people are in their own kind of decisions for where they're going to spend their money, we want to support the people who have purchased um, our hardware as long as we possibly can. And I think xCloud gives us that opportunity when we look at the Xbox One base. We have a browser there. It's a Chrome based browser that we can target um, bringing next gen or now current gen experiences to. Uh, and I love that as an opportunity for people. Maybe certain people, Xbox One will be the console that they keep or as, as long as they can, forever, whatever that means. Um, and other people are maybe just waiting for availability of the next consoles for a Series S or Series X before they, they move up. And we think delivering via the cloud gives us that opportunity. And as you said, for developers, some of them lets them move their capability on and uh, and they don't they won't need to go back and support the last generation as they're looking forward, but it lets us say what we meant to, what we've been saying all along is we want to allow you to play the games that you want on the devices that you have. Um, there will be some point, I'm sure that you know that won't be possible on old hardware. I've had questions asked about 360 uh, and other things, but yeah, I think it is a, a great bridge opportunity for us, and it's one of the powers that the cloud gives us. A lot to unpack there, really. I mean, again, we've been talking about this stuff over the past couple of years on RDX Podcast. Uh, that's here on the channel. Very forward thinking right there from Microsoft, all the way down to the silicon in the boxes and the server blades, having the ability to power four instances of Xbox One S cloud play, right? Now they've upgraded the resolution of xCloud. They've reduced the latency, though still not perfect. Infrastructure has work to do. Bottom line is, when it comes down to it, you'll be able to play games like Flight Simulator, yes, a true next-generation game, on your soon-to-be 10-year-old Xbox One. 
And again, there's a reason I've been saying for about a year that there would be a high likelihood of this game running at 30 frames plus on series consoles, because even on the PC right now, there are severe CPU bottlenecks. So obviously this game could never run on an Xbox One from 2013. CPU was obviously the bottleneck there. They're gonna bring it to you through the cloud and you can expect many more titles like this. It's worth noting that when developers make a game for Xbox One, it automatically works in xCloud. They just have to give their consent. This means developers are less hesitant in moving their game design onto better hardware. They know that they've still got all those potential cloud users. They're not going to be afraid to move forward with their innovation. And uh, hey, I'm all for it. Phil does seem to think that the best option here are, well, is options. And uh, it's up to you what you want to do. Maybe get xCloud and try it out and do these things, or maybe get a full-on console. Chip shortages and other things play a role. But uh, hey, let me know your thoughts on all that down below as we move into some more interesting information here. You guys completely own the Western RPG now. Not that there aren't other publishers making good Western RPGs, but you know, you, you start to go through it. Avowed Outer Worlds 2, Two unannounced Unreal Engine 5 RPGs from In Exile, Fable, Elder Scrolls. Now, Ryan has a good point here. They do absolutely nearly dominate the Western RPG genre. Witcher says hello, of course, and by my count, this is still the best RPG ever made. But Microsoft have a massive array of RPGs. When it comes to In Exile, Phil does not interject here. He does not deny this. In fact, he shakes his head in some kind of acknowledgement. Two unannounced Unreal Engine 5 RPGs from In Exile, and I've heard at least one of them is Fallout. Yes, I've mentioned this multiple times over my own videos and podcasts. This was something I was told some time ago, and remember, Brian Fargo and company were the ones who actually built up the Fallout IP, eventually selling it to Bethesda, yes, when they were known as Interplay. He then ran off and started a different studio in Exile. Now they are reunited with the opportunity to work on Fallout once more not so crazy sounding huh once more let me know what you think about this i haven't heard this anywhere aside from this channel and um you know maybe it's true maybe it's not but uh, at the end of the day i'm throwing out what i've heard let me know what you guys think about that fallout in exile unreal engine 5 maybe it's an alternate take on fallout in a different time maybe it is just uh fallout new vegas 2 you just never never know one thing that we do know is that no matter what it is, In Exile are building more quality games for Xbox, and that's what we've been asking for. Quality. And I cannot wait to see it. From an economic standpoint, I see the same chatter, like, is it profitable? How does it work for us? It's pretty straightforward. Um, we invest in our first party games. We invest in specific third party deals to bring games into Game Pass. Game Pass is obviously a revenue stream. Uh, we have subscribers and those subscribers are paying money every month and that creates a revenue pool for us um, in Game Pass. And that's a fairly large number at this point. In addition, those games sell on our platform. They're in our stores, whether it's on Windows or on console or now with cloud um, out there as well. So when we look at the economics of Game Pass, it's not just is a subscribe, how many games is this subscriber playing in the subscription? And if they would have purchased those games or some number of those games, you know, what's the trade off on purchase versus subscriber revenue? We never really look at it that way. What we do is we say, are we growing the number of players on our platform and are they playing more often? Um, and from that activity, we see the business grows. The number one metric that we can look at to see if our business is actually growing is are people playing more on the platform? There's not, it's not, there's nothing about review score. There's nothing about retail sales of console or retail sales of games. The number one sign that our platform is healthy and growing is actually engagement on the platform from players. And that is what Game Pass is growing. So our business continues to grow and continues to be profitable at xbox and um and we're very proud of that like it's important so game pass 30 million strong is doing very very well and they are surprising fans with day and date titles like mlb the show outriders affectionately known as trash uh, by myself as well as many others coming up this does include games like flight sim age of empires back for blood you're getting so many titles one each month they are rolling these things out and they are looking to keep you satiated with the service satiated remind me to never say that again now i like to listen to phil talk about these game pass figures and why they are doing what they're doing because there are so many people that still say it's not feasible 
I don't understand. As I always say, they can count much higher than you can. They're Microsoft, right? They know if they're making money or not, and they are already profitable with Game Pass quite some time ago, far earlier than anyone projected. As you know, Disney+, Plus, Netflix, all these services, when they initially do begin their run, have to invest a ton of money. They take a big loss over several years, eventually making it up with a massive climb in subscribers. Game Pass hasn't had to do this because not only do they, like you said, throw their games in the service, enticing you to subscribe, but these games are still on sale in every single store they were before. In fact, you get a discount for buying it as a Game Pass member. There is no negative as a developer. You get a big chunk of money that you, one, agreed to. You then accept that money in exchange for your game, their day and date, or whenever it does hit, and your title still gets to sell in all the same places. It's really not fair to those not in Game Pass. So if you're not in Game Pass, you might want to consider it. To be serious, though, there is no negative to Game Pass that I have seen personally. I think the games they have released since they've started really pushing Game Pass have not really seen negative effects, at least right off the top of my head. Any issues with games can be relegated to, hey, we need more time. And Phil had been preaching the, we got more time, we're going to invest more quality, quality, quality. Well, be sure and give those teams that time because I know there was a lot of people that had some issues with the Sea of Thieves at DLC. The second Tall Tale was broken. I know that Gears 5 had some glitches when it finally did hit the public, though it didn't have those glitches before it hit the public, oddly enough. But hey, let me know if you had any glitches before you hit the public. And also let me know your thoughts on some of these comments. New games coming from In Exile to AAA Unreal Engine 5 titles coming from this one studio. Again, personally, I've heard it's Fallout, one of them at least, and that would be super intriguing. Think Outer Worlds, but in the Fallout universe, more dialogue, perhaps more in depth this time around with a bigger studio, and of course, much better funding. They've also announced Outer Worlds 2, so, you know, they've got to walk a fine line here. They've got to be very, very different from one another. Or do they? Let me know your thoughts on that down below. And of course, if you ended up liking the video, hit the like button, tell a buddy or two, subscribe for all of the latest and greatest. I'll have more videos coming out. And of course, very few of you will actually hear this, so I'm sure I'll get a ton of messages still. But um, yeah, probably no podcast this upcoming Tuesday. I'll be out of town. And um, man, I hope all of you stay safe. Don't lick any handrails. And of course, let me know your thoughts down below. Patrons, thank you so much for what you do. Channel members, thank you so much for what you do. Moderators of the fantastic RDX podcast, thank you so much for what you do. You power the channel, you make it go. Now, let your grandma know. Subscribe. I'm Dealer. I'm out.